Welcome to WXTV, your online source for weatherization training. In continuing on looking at alternative energy options for homeowners in our consumer education series, we'll take a look at solar domestic hot water systems like the one you see being installed behind me. And again, we'll team up with Michael Goldschmidt of the University of Missouri Extension as he works with Dan Shifley, who walks us through a typical system. I'm here with Dan Shifley, and he's with Missouri Sun Power, and he's going to talk to us today about solar hot water heating. Dan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Mike. How are you? I'm doing good, thanks. So, Dan, let's uh, talk about this house. So, up here we have what uh, people would recognize as solar panels, but instead of generating electricity, these are generating hot uh, water, right? That's absolutely right. The, what you have up here is two flat plate collectors. These use the power of the sun to capture heat for domestic hot water. On all solar installations, we want the panels to be facing as close to true south as possible. Uh, within about 30 degrees, either direction is okay. And then as far as the tilt of these collectors, you want it to be aesthetically pleasing. So in general, you're going to flush mount on a roof like in this scenario like this. But to maximize winter production, you may tilt it above 15 degrees above the latitude or get it as close to 10 degrees above latitude as possible within the confines of aesthetics. We still get a lot of the same efficiency without too much reduction here. In this case, it's a 812 pitch roof, so we're about 34 degrees, slightly below latitude, but still getting a good, uh, good efficiency. The sizing of the system it has to do with the domestic hot water load, and it's specifically for hot water, not how much water you use in a day, but how much hot water you use in a day. Uh, a general rule of thumb is 20 gallons per person per day, uh, so a typical family of four would be about 80 gallons of hot water usage on an average day and then you size the collectors and the storage tank based on that uh, domestic hot water number. Most typically you're looking at two four foot by eight foot panels on the roof, which is what you see behind us. In general, we shoot for somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the annual hot water load. Um, ideally, we like to get closer to 75 percent on the true average with getting approximately 90 percent in the su summer and early spring and fall months and maybe 60 percent in the winter. Um, the remainder of the hot water load is picked up by the backup water heater. In this particular case, although this is a large house, it has five bedrooms, and has the potential to house a lot more occupants, there's only two of them living here right now. So the water load is lower than the house could be suited for. In that case, if you were to use a pressurized glycol system, you're going to have overheating issues because the water is not being, the hot water is not being used and replenished and those collectors sit there full of the propylene glycol stagnant. Whereas the drain back system, and in this case, we've actually, when the collectors are not being used, when the system's off, all that water literally drains back into a drain back tank, which offers uh, overheat protection as well as freeze protection in the winter. There is no need to uh, tie into a grid or anything like that. This is producing hot water for this home and nowhere else. And in addition to the roof mount, if there's not a suitable roof, these can be ground mounted as well. Well, what you're seeing here is actually an exposed the, the two pipes going to the collectors, the cold inlet and the hot output, are exposed in this case because we, we're trying to avoid penetrating the roof over the structure itself. These are actually penetrating a garage roof, and that allowed us to reduce the chance of water infiltration as well as hit a chase in the garage wall to make it easier to get down to the basement where the balance of systems are. And we took a small aesthetic kit here to make it substantially easier to install, which reduced the cost. Yeah, the green pipe you see come out is coming off the top of the collectors, which is the hot side, and the black pipe going in is the cold feed to the collectors. But uh, the green insulation is a specific closed cell, high temperature insulation suitable for the temperatures involved in the system. So um, I also noticed that it, you can see it on the roof, but these are not actually attached directly to the roof. There are two metal rails there that raise those panels up off the roof. Could you explain what those are for? Yeah, what we have underneath there is actually a total of 10 uh, 
flashings. It's a, a, a large flashing with a one penetration, greatly reduces the chance of water ever getting in the home, and then aluminum unistrut on top of those that those are mounted to. So there are some penetrations underneath there, but not in such a way that we will create flashing or wa water or ice dam issues underneath the collectors. And we do get uh, quite a bit of hail here in the Midwest. Could you explain about these panels and hail? Uh, I, although they are not hail proof, they are hail tested. And to my knowledge, I, the manufacturers I've spoken with have not had one break due to hail, but uh, it's certainly possible. Fortunately, the glass can be replaced without tearing down the whole collector. So you don't have to completely replace a, a uh, collector. You can just replace the glass on top. If Absolutely. Be a high Absolutely. Then, oh, great. Well, let's, let's go ahead and go on to the, the rest of the system. Okay. In this case, we have the pipes you can kind of see up here running along. They're coming through a chase in the garage while they run here, come back down, and go into the drain back tank as well as the bottom of the storage tank. In a drain back system, it's very important that there's at least a quarter inch of foot of fall in order to allow the system to drain back into this drain back tank, which you can see right here. And on the drain back tank, there's a sight glass so you can see the water level. When it's off as it is now, all the water has filled back up in this tank, the collectors are empty. When it's running, the water level runs to about right here as this is all circulated through. On the collectors on the roof, there's a temperature sensor which is tied into this differential controller right here. When the differential controller senses there's enough heat to be gained, meaning the collectors are hot enough or of higher temperature than what's in the storage tank, it'll turn this pump on. These pumps circulate fluid through the collector back down, drop it in here, it was just hot, and there's actually an internal heat exchanger in here, and that in turn heats the water in the storage tank, and then the hot water from the storage tank gets plumbed into the water heater, which becomes the auxiliary water heater in this case, or the backup, and then you know, on their days when it's cloudy for a week or in the winter where there's not as much sun and it's not as strong of sun, uh, the water heater may turn on to make sure the homeowner has warm showers. Have you done any evaluation of the system to see um, um, over time, um, how efficient it is? Does it stay pretty efficient over time? Uh, it does. We put the system in beginning of July, and I know in July and August, he literally shut the, this water heater off, had no complaints. Once we got into um, first part of October, where we had a, a, about a week of cloud straight, they did wind up turning it back on. We don't have any specific usage data on this water heater, but he's mentioned that it's substantially less than it was. And, and for a viewer's uh, knowledge, this is a pretty much a conventional water heater. So the backup water heating system is a standard off-the-shelf uh, water heater that's connected to the system for the solar hot water. Right. In this case, this water heater was existing. For, to, to make a solar water heater in a home, you're typically adding a storage tank, a differential controller, the collectors, and a couple of pumps. There's no need to buy a new water heater. They're using the existing water heater. Uh, one important thing to note, too, uh, something that's not always required on a home but is required for a solar water heating system is a tempering valve or a mix valve. It's because you have the potential to send 150, 180 degree water out to the faucets which could scald, burn, or seriously injure someone. So this automatically mixes cold water in to whatever's coming out of this tank. So it's always whatever the te set temperature is but it's never above that temperature. The differential controller is telling me the collectors are 98 degrees and actually climbing right now. The center of this storage tank, which is where this sensor well is here, is at 97.5 degrees. The peak high temperature of the storage tank over the last 24 hours was 112, and it got down to 82 degrees, probably when the homeowner started using more water, either last night or this morning. Um, so when this differential between the collectors and the storage tanks gets to be 16 degrees, these pumps will turn on and it'll begin circulating until the temperature differential is down to four degrees, which is about the point where there's not enough heat to be captured to justify running the pumps. And then it'll shut off and that'll repeat uh, day in, day out as it goes. And I'm gonna manually turn this on because we haven't hit that temperature yet. So what you're seeing there is the blue light pumps on. It takes just a minute for these pumps to run up, fill the collectors, and then break the cycle and come back down and around. In this case, we had to use two pumps due to the head. It's about uh, 28 feet that we're climbing to get up there. Typically, you'd only need one pump. And so then you can, I don't know if you can see on camera or not, this water level's dropping here. Yes. And that's what's happening there is the pumps are pumping this all the way up to the collectors, filling the collectors, and then this will eventually start coming back down. You'll see this level move up and down a little bit. Um, but it, even with that water coming around and coming back into this tank, it's still a pretty quiet system. So we're just about to that point. 
where we should start hearing it come back a bit. And so at this point, the, pump, the pumps have pumped water, the heat transfer fluid up to the collectors all the way back around, and now it's running as a continuous loop. And this will continue to run until that temperature differential is met. So I'm curious as to whether people could combine an instantaneous water heater and a solar collector in the same system. Uh, it's certainly possible. The thing I don't like about using an instantaneous water heater with a solar water heating system is those have a maximum temperature that inlet temperature can be, and that's frequently exceeded by the solar hot water system. Uh, so you're actually putting this mixing valve ahead of your instantaneous heater. So in this case, it would be downstream from here. To, so you might actually have to be cooling the water you're putting into the instantaneous water heater so you can run it through and, and on out. Um, so there's a little bit, it's a little bit less efficient way to do it, whereas a, ideally, you know, electric water heater, which doesn't have the flue up the middle, uh, would be probably the best backup storage tank in terms of ongoing utility use. One of the real advantages of a solar hot water heating system is that there's virtually no maintenance by the homeowner. Uh, other than checking it periodically, say once a month, to, to ensure that it actually is producing heat and everything appears in good working order, there's no war warning lights or anything like that. And uh, if it's a pressurized glycol system, checking the pH level every two to three years would typically be done by the installing contractor. Uh, that's really about it. Uh, this is certainly within the scope of uh, do-it-yourselfer. It's a lot of work. There's plumbing, there's carpentry, there's electrical, there's a lot of different components coming together as well as some specific uh, flashings and insulations and a couple other uh, very specific requirements to make sure that it's a, suitable for use with the high temperatures and high pressures this system can produce. Um, so all in all, although it could be done by a do-it-yourselfer, it's probably better left to a professional. Well, the upfront cost varies on several different things. One is, the, you know, the domestic hot water load, the uh, ease of installation of the system, and a couple other variables in terms of the type. But in general, an upfront cost is in anywhere between eight and ten thousand dollars, with uh, thirty percent and more of that available as a tax credit or other rebates. So, with the tax credit, it might be possible for a moderate income family to afford to install one of these on their existing home. Yeah, it could be a stretch to save up for the first cost, but in addition to the tax credits and rebates, a lot of local utilities or states have either grants or energy efficiency loan programs that make it much more affordable up front. And, and for tax credits, this is a 30% tax credit? Or? There's a 30% federal tax credit, which is good for the cost of the, the complete cost of the system, which includes material and labor. Uh, here in Columbia, there's an additional rebate from the city of Columbia. And also in the state of Missouri, I believe there is a state tax deduction as well. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks, Mike. Well, that's it for another episode of WXTV. Heating water can be one of the greatest sources of energy consumption in a home. Looking at alternative energy options, this cost can make solar water heating very attractive. The upfront cost is lower than some other alternative energy options. They're relatively maintenance free, especially for those drain back systems. And you're only supplying water for yourself, so there's no need to tie into existing infrastructure. It's for these reasons that we think solar water heating is a viable technology for the homeowner. And thanks for watching. For more information on the tax credits available in your area, visit the Database of State Incentives for Renewables and Efficiency, or DESIRE, at DesireUSA.org. WXTV, your online source for weatherization information, techniques and expert advice.